All right, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining this V Brown Bag Tech Talk on the ultimate guide to beating ransomware and staying available. My name is Clint Wyckoff and I'm a senior technical evangelist with Veeam Software and thanks for taking a few minutes to join us today. I really appreciate it. So how many people out there have started to see these really, really fun emails that they're getting in their inbox, right? Just a few weeks ago as I was going through and making this presentation, I got this fun email, right? And so you can see here it says, click this link to go download and pay an invoice for something that I didn't buy or any services I didn't receive. And what's really interesting is recently I received one of these very similar emails from the president of our company, Peter McKay, right? Saying, hey, Clint, go click this link, go out to this, to this website and, and pay an invoice. Well, we're starting to see these social attacks starting to happen more and more frequently inside of any type of environment, whether that be home users, right? Your mama, your father, your grandfather, your aunt, your uncle, your son, your daughter, or also on the enterprise side of the fence as well. So your users, your, your, your customers are starting to see these emails for social engineering uh, and they're ultimately ransomware attacks to place a piece of software inside of an operating system to encrypt data for you to go out and pay a ransom, right? So that's kind of the, the topic of today's discussion and regardless of what vertical you're in, so if you're healthcare, if you're manufacturing, or if you're retail, you know, regardless of where your business lies, you're susceptible to ransomware, okay? So what we're gonna go through today is talk about some best practices and what I have come to see be somewhat reasonable ways of maintaining success and trying to you know, make sure that your systems are able to be recovered without having to pay any type of ransom. So. Before we get into it, anybody out there have an, any idea what, what is ransomware? Has anybody been affected by ransomware ever recently? No? Nobody's, but you guys have like the best IT shops ever? You mean to tell me none of your parents or nobody's ever been affected by ransomware? Well, I, my uh, mother-in-law recently was, right? She, uh, the crypto locker, so all of her files start, had the dot crypto uh, extension on them, they all got encrypted. Um, ultimately, what ransomware is, it's a piece of malicious software that gets loaded inside of an operating system. And there's different ways that it uh, presents the, the payload or what it is requesting you to go pay the quote unquote ransom. So it can either encrypt the entire file system, right, so that the machine is no longer even bootable, or it can go out and and encrypt specific file extensions. So if it was like a .pdf or a .docx, right? It can go out and encrypt those specific types of files. And even some of the more recent attacks, we're starting to see not just individual PC infections, but they can spread out across a network, right? So they're able to kind of grab credentials. So whether that be domain administrator credentials and go out and say, for instance, encrypt an entire file share, right? Where all of your users documents lie. But the most important thing for Ransomware is they don't necessarily care about the data. And most times if you do pay the ransom, the hackers will actually tell you how they got inside of your environment, right? And, and what they did to, to gain access. But the most important thing for, for, for a hacker is they want you to pay the ransom, right? They want the money. That's what they're, they're after. And as you can see here, there's been many different variants of, of ransomware. Probably the most recent one out there was the, was the WannaCry, and that one has received much publicity recently. Um, and this one was unique because, as I mentioned, it was able to get inside of environments and then capture credentials and, and spread out, right? So it was able to, once it was inside of an infrastructure via one point of entry, it was able to kind of land and expand and spread like a, like a virus, essentially. Um, but there's been other variants, as you can see here as well. And there's different approaches. So any of you guys use LinkedIn? Girls use LinkedIn? We all do. Do you ever start to see some of these rogue re uh, requests from people you have absolutely no idea who they are? Well, now they're actually starting to look at enterprise IT guys. So they're actually going out and doing searches for IT administrator or you know um, system administrator or engineer because what they're doing is they're targeting IT guys, so that they, they can figure out, okay, so if it's clint.wyckoff at veeam.com, it's probably john.do at veeam.com. And he's the enterprise admin, and this is what maybe what their usernames are. So they're starting to attack you guys so that they can try to gather your credentials and get access inside of your environments, right? So we're starting to see that happen a lot more frequently. Uh, one of our partners uh, at Veeam recently had a customer 
and they, uh, their, their backup server got encrypted. Anton shared this in his forum digest just last week. I don't know if you guys follow the Veeam community forums, um, but basically they had their backup server exposed out to the internet and their, their password was like password one, two, three exclamation point. And guess what? They got inside of their network. They encrypted their, the partner as well as two of his customers because he had all of his cached credentials inside of his RDP session right there. So, so there's a lot of different things that you can do to help prevent yourself. Um, but also, so there's different ways of access. There's Trojan, there's malware, social media, as I mentioned, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. Um, but also there's even this concept of ransomware as a service. We've heard of everything as a service, infrastructure as a service, backup, DR, everything has a service. But now there's even ransomware as a service. So you can actually go out on the website, sign up for as little as $175 and start deploying ransomware and getting paid for it, right? Um, and so that's, like I said, the most important thing to these ransomware hackers isn't necessarily the data itself, but is getting paid, right? That's what they want. So recently, uh, Google actually did a, a study and they found that whenever they drop these USB drives around parking lots and bathrooms and random places, approximately 49% of people would actually take those USB drives without having any knowledge of what's on them whatsoever and plug them into their, to their computers, right? And in this specific example that the register um, has out here, you can actually go out and do this inside of your environment and test and see and use this as an education opportunity for people. So I would actually go back inside of, if I was still an IT guy and just randomly place USB drives around the office and see who plugs them in and have it just send an email back to you or the CIO or whoever you want or see your security team and use that as a kind of way to highlight what ransomware can do in, in, in the kind of is an education opportunity. Um, so I think that's a, a pretty good, pretty cool idea. So the big picture of ransomware. Now, it's been around for a long time back. Actually, kind of the first iteration of ransomware was at the World Health um, Organization. It was a trade show back in 1989. And the guy that was running this, he was seeking funding to do research on AIDS, the HIV virus, right? So he actually handed out floppy disks at this conference at this show that had essentially ransomware, one of the first versions of ransomware, where it, wanted, it prompted the users to pay 189 bucks, $189. And he was going to use the, that $189 as funding for his research against AIDS, right? So he was seeking funding and he was using this as a mechanism to get money from the, from the attendees. So um, you can see here it's, it's evolved. Now this screen right here is probably very popular. I'm sure you've at least seen it before if you haven't been affected by ransomware, but this is known as the payload. Once the machine has been infected, you get prompted to pay the, the ransom and whether that be a, a, you know, essentially locking the computer. So as soon as it boots up, it prompts you to, uh, to, to pay the ransom. Or if you try to navigate around, um, you get constantly prompted to, to, to pay the ransom. Now, most commonly, the, the methodology in which these, these hackers recently, you know, would like to be paid is in an e-currency. And that typical e-currency is either Mint, that's a popular one, or Bitcoin. I would say probably Bitcoin is the, the more popular because any of those e-currencies, they're completely 100% not traceable back to where the, where the money is going, right? So for those hackers that are requesting payment in e-currency, that's not traceable back to, to, to them, right? So they're able to get paid in a completely 100% anonymous fashion. And as I mentioned, there's even websites where you can go and you can sign up. You can see here that you can, you know, participate in ransomware as a service. So back in 2016, we did a, a study of approximately 900 companies, some of which were Veeam customers, some of which are not Veeam customers. And probably the most interesting fact on this screen right here is that 84% of the folks that were uh, surveyed were able to recover without having to pay the ransom. So really the, the way that I view this is you have three options. You can either have complete data loss and not pay the ransom and not be able to recover your data. You can pay the ransom and get the decryption key, or you can recover from any type of backup that you have, right? So you really have got three different options there. 
The other interesting study that we've done is with our support organization. So in 2016, we had approximately five cases that were opened in that beginning of that year um, in relation to ransomware. And at the end, we were up to 35 cases. So there's been a severe kind of increase in customers that were contacting our technical support comp or organization looking for help in recovering from ransomware attacks inside of their environment. So this is definitely something that's on the uh, on the rise and kind of another small segment of those requests we're looking for folks looking for help on how to make sure that their environment was set up optimally optimally so you know we can make and take a lot of different studies and really dive into the cost of what downtime is associated right so we can dive into the and look at the cost of what ransomware is typically you know any individual machine that is that is uh, affected by ransomware, the 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 ransom is typically around one to three Bitcoin, which, if you relate that into U.S. dollars, is around one thousand to three thousand U.S. dollars per machine. Now, the <clears throat> the interesting part of the ransomware cost. So they want to get as much money and exploit you as, as much as possible because they want to, you know, that's what, that's what they want. They want the money. They want you to pay the ransom, but they can't make the ransom so outrageous that you don't pay it because, you know, if it was like $10,000 per computer, you know what, there's no way in the, the, that anyone is going to do that. They're going to figure out some other way. But if, so if the path of least resistance is, oh, you know what, I'll just pay the ransom. It's not that bad, right? Um, so that's kind of getting inside of what their, their thought process there. So, um, and as I mentioned, e-currency, Bitcoin, and you can actually go out here on the New York Stock Exchange. So this is pretty relevant data. It's as of last Friday, September 8th. So you can see here that the one individual stock of Bitcoin is around 4,300 US dollars. That's for one share. And as of right now, it's up almost 600% over the last year. So I think that's pretty telling. And then you can see here, if you trend this out, you know, the Bitcoin itself, very, very, very little. So if you were an investor back in 2015, beginning of 2015, and you invested in Bitcoin and you own shares of that, you are probably made a right investment. <laughs> but the most important thing here is we've all, as we've discussed, the goal is always the same and those hackers want to get your money. And as I mentioned, you know, we can take studies and we can put marketing documentation together and all this stuff, but the cost of downtime is real. Now, whether that be, you know, on system downtime and user downtime, developers, whatever, there's a cost associated with that, whether that be a hard cost of people sitting at their desk twiddling their thumbs, or that be the cost of actual machines offline, okay? Whether that be servers, desktops, workstations, right, applications. but. Most commonly, you think that ransomware is only for Windows. Well, guess what? You're wrong, because now there's even attacks out there that are specifically for Linux operating systems, Mac OS, right? So not only are Windows operating systems susceptible, but also, um, you know, those other types, Linux, Mac OS, they're open fair game too. So go out on the Googles there. If, if this piques your interest, you can actually become a hacker yourself and you can sign up and you don't even need to know anything whatsoever about ransomware because that's what the ransomware as a service they make it really simple and easy for you to go out there and get started for as little as one hundred and seventy five dollars and that's they've even got different packs and different levels that you can sign up for and that's just the starter pack so you can even upgrade and get kind of advanced ransomware as a service deployments so if this sounds like something of interest to you even you knowing nothing whatsoever you don't know how to code you don't know how to do anything all you need to do is go and sign up this as a service and i think that is telling of just the industry in general um because you've had you know the rise of ransomware obviously there's money to be made to the point where companies i mean they might not be the most um uh how do i say this the most uh, forthcoming best organizations out there but that you know you can sign up for I think that's pretty interesting. So, data takeover. Really, I think the most important thing here is, th is being agile because not only being able to make sure that you're protected from ransomware, but also if you're affected, you can recover from it as well. So, some of the, the different steps that you can take. Probably some of you think that, you know, security endpoint gateway devices, some antivirus, some of those more modern um, uh, 
ways of protecting are okay. So being able to, um, some of the more an modern antiviruses actually have like built-in fencing where they can quarantine off, um, or even some of the security gateway devices will do uh, file scans of different files that get emailed into the systems, and you can look and inspect those. So, but if you're relying on antivirus alone, if it's already at the endpoint, it's too late, right? So. Chances are those antiviruses, their definitions aren't updated until after the ransomware has already been deployed. So they're not re um, pr uh, kind of being proactive, they're more reactive. It'll help the spread of ransomware inside of an environment if the antivirus definitions are updated automatically, but you still are could be affected, right? And depending on what that source machine or patient zero is, the effect could be large. If it was like my file server, for instance, that got encrypted before Jane's machine in accounting, right? So how to prepare. So I think one of the things that most commonly gets overlooked is not just Windows updates itself, but different application updates. So if you have legacy versions of like, say for instance, um, Internet Explorer, right? So if you have an app that, re re that requires different versions of Java that are inside of your environment, those are typically most commonly known as the ways that uh, software systems that get exploited, you know, most commonly. Um, and then kind of one of the things that we used to do whenever I was on the end user side of the fence is we would go out and commission uh, different companies to come in and do penetration testing and see, you know, where the different, um, you know, kind of vulnerabilities are, train the staff. Now, this is probably one of the more important steps that you can take, not only training the IT staff itself, but your end users, your customers, right? Making sure that they're aware, you know, hey, if you see an email that comes across that smells funny and looks funny, it's probably funny and you shouldn't click on those attachments or those links that come through. And then down here, you know, backing up your systems, backing up your information, making sure that you have, you know, products in place that are able to back up and recover also and getting that data to a secure off-site location. So, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. So this is pretty interesting. Cisco has actually put together uh, the Cisco Talus Intelligence and you can see it there on the screen, the URL. If you go out there, they actually have a complete published list of zero day, zero day vulnerabilities of different software suites. And I think you'd be surprised what you would find out there. There's a lot of really bad software vulnerabilities that are, that are susceptible. Um, and they even have a complete section of that site that's dedicated to vulnerabilities that are in Microsoft specific uh, operating systems. So whether that be Internet Explorer, Windows Server, um, uh, Windows 10, Windows 7, and even has historical information as well. So you can see what the different vulnerabilities are and what patches are required to, to fix those. Um, so updates, not only just Windows updates, but updating the software that runs on the desktops is, is important. Um, routinely, routine, routinely, I don't know why that was a tongue twister, routinely auditing. One of the things that, again, whenever I was on the end user side of the fences, we would routinely audit who was a member of, like, say, for instance, the domain admins group, right? How many people, how many IT guys out there, you know, what's the easiest thing whenever they request access? I just throw them in this group right here. It already exists, but chances are it has too many permissions for what they're required to do their job. So, oh, you know what, just throw them in domain admin. We'll take it out later. Chances are you forget to take it out, or whenever you do take it out, they bark and complain because, oh, my access was removed. So it's a revolving door there of, of, of problems. But, you know, domain administrator has the keys to the castle, right? He's the everything. So making sure that you're auditing um, education. I think this is an extremely important piece because this right here is essentially free. There's no cost to, to educate not only yourself or your, your customers or your, your, um, uh, the folks inside of your office. Backup, backup, backup. This is kind of probably one of the more important things that's out there. You definitely want to make sure that you're backing up your data um, so that you're able to recover. So anyone ever heard of the 3 one rule? Yeah, Alistair has, and I know several of our viewers online that are watching today are as also, but it's three copies of my data, one of those copies being my production on two different types of media, one of those offsite, and then the last one, we've 3210, is being able to recover with zero errors or zero problems. Now, why is the offsite piece of this the most important whenever you're getting or trying to stay prepared or 
you know, unaffected by ransomware. Because if it's disconnected from the network, if it's offline, if it's at a separate s site, if, if you're using, you know, VLAN segmentation, for instance, and we'll talk about that here in a second, if you have something that's air-gapped, completely disconnected, like a tape library, right? You can't encrypt the tape library because the tapes are ejected or in, they're in a, a cave at Iron Mountain somewhere, right? They're completely 100% offline. So rotating hard drives, right, or tape libraries, they're a good way of staying protected from ransomware. You can't encrypt what's not connected, right? So there's different ways, direct attached storage, offline, um, you know, offline except during the backup window. So having the system ejected out or the file system ejected whenever the backup's complete, right? You can do that via scripting. You can have that built into the software itself. This here, physical servers, mixing operating system types. I think that's really important having Linux systems out there that are responsible for, like, say, for instance, backup or different file services, DNS, right? Having Linux as well as Windows and then having some of your mission critical things like backup server not be domain joined because if it does get access, ransomware does get access or a hacker gets inside of your environment, chances are it's with domain credentials, not local administrator credentials. And if it is local administrator, it's, I mean, it's computer name slash administrator. It can't go any further than that, right? So it can't run as another, you know, domain system account or a domain um, uh, user account inside the system. Strong passwords, we recommend, or I recommend at least 16 characters because once you get past 16 character passwords, it's almost impossible to do a reverse hash against that. Um, use a service provider, Linux credentials, as I mentioned, if it get access to a Windows machine, it can't, the ransomware obviously won't go on to the, to the Linux operating systems. And then uh, separate credentials for shares. Say, for instance, you know, having, you know, not a share that doesn't have like wide open access for, for everyone um, putting credentials on there. So different types of snapshots, backups, backup copy job, tape libraries. The more copies of your backups, the better off you are. And um, we like to call kind of the offline tape storage here being air gap protection, right? Something that has completely physical separation, completely 100% disconnected off the corporate network there. Also storing your backups on different types of repositories, whether that be Linux repositories, Windows repositories, I mentioned before using work group accounts or a great or a work group uh, essentially joined machines so they're not on the domain. VLAN segmentation, having you know, DMZ, for instance, right? If you have, you know, PCI data, or if you're in retail, that's kind of where my background comes from. Um, so having those machines completely segmented away from the production network. So if you have development, production, QA, have different VLANs that are completely segmented off so that, you know, there's zero communication between the different networks so that they can't kind of spread through there, air gapped, offline. This is a really resilient way of making sure that your backups are able to be recovered and not be able to be encrypted whenever ransomware strikes. Um, and some of the last pieces here. And this slide isn't something that I put together, even though it had animation on it. It's a fun slide, right? You like that click, click, click. Um, but this is actually from the FBI themselves, the Federal Bureau, Bureau of Investigation. They say, you know, you have three different options there, the pay the ransom, recover from backup, and then they, obviously they want you to contact them even though chances are the hackers will never be found. So really there's different outcomes, pay the ransom or you can lose the data. Unfortunately, both of those outcomes are really, really, really horrible. So you can either pay now to make sure that your systems are able to be recovered and your environment is protected, or you can choose to, to pay later. And that's really where kind of the, the, the spin that we were taking today is making sure that you don't have to pay the ransom and that you're protected ahead of time. But if things do strike, you're able to recover. Now, virtualized systems, virtualized servers, this is VM world. Obviously, you guys are virtualizing things out there as you should. But what about non-virtualized machines? So kind of the physical physical Windows Linux operating systems. You know, this is something that Veeam is kind of new to, right? We were first in the virtualized backup space. We now have agents for both Linux um, as well as the Windows operating systems, you know, Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows 10, Windows Server 2016 even, all the way up to the latest Windows 10 creators update. But you can't encrypt what's not connected, as I mentioned. So we've even put places, checkboxes, something as simple as a checkbox here to it 
eject your uh, backup media whenever the backup is complete. So if I have a workstation, you know, my home PC or an end user device that has a USB drive that I'm backing up to, whenever that backup is complete, we'll automatically eject it out so that it can't be encrypted. Because chances are workstation devices are like how uh, ransomware is going to get into an environment. Um, so it's even having something as simple as a, as a checkbox that automatically ejects that um, whenever the backup's done. So really quick, you know, kind of the, the Veeam story here, and we've started on the virtual side of the fence. Now we've expanded out and we really have data protection for pretty much any environment, whether it's on-premises, public cloud, private cloud, software as a service, managed service provider, that's what we do. And we have a whole list of products that help people achieve their goals. So, you know, if any of this sounds of interest to you guys, definitely stop by, say hello, um, visit the website, you can connect off with us, you'll get access to this presentation afterwards via the V Brown bags. And here's just a quick summary of everything that we talked about today. So you can kind of take this as a bullet list item um, back and make sure that you know you're challenging yourself or you're challenging your partners, your customers, or even your mother at home to make sure that she's protected because chances are if your mom's PC gets ransomware, she's gonna call you. So you want to make sure that you're able to help her out. I appreciate everybody's time. Thanks for joining us today, and I hope you enjoyed this V Brown Bag Tech Talk.